uh, when Epi and Preeti reached out to me saying that uh, they want me to speak out here and at a crowdsourcing week and uh, share some thoughts on how, what we are doing. Uh, yeah, it's great business to be doing all these kind of stuff, getting people together. Uh, are we really fixing a problem somewhere? And frankly speaking, in India, there are three things which really motivate us. Uh, one is the democracy, which is the politics. The second thing is cricket, and third is Bollywood. And I was thinking of a topic for the, today's discussion, and this is what it came up. Uh, we want to actually democratize the whole concept of debt. Uh, it's not to do just because we like to do it. Uh, is there a problem? Yes, there's a problem. This is the reality. Let me, sorry to be talking about it. There's a lady from DBS who spoke about what great things they are doing. I respect that. Uh, but the key problem is, the whole system is broken. System is so broken that it's become a deadly problem. It's actually a people are dying because of it. End of the day, it's a business. Because of a business, people can't die. And I'm not talking as a socialist or a communist or a person who's uh, saying that socialize everything, but there's a problem to fix out there. Now, this death uh, has to be seen in a context. These are the real numbers. A country like, I'm using all India numbers, I'm not going world, because we are very entrenched in India. Uh, these are the realities of the numbers. The banks are, have an average profit of 30%. And it's year on year. The second thing is that they are growing at CAGR of 20%, some of them at 30% over the last 10 years. They average, not the net interest margins, the interest margins the cost of borrowing was vis-a-vis -vis cost of lending is nearly 10%, right? So somebody is making tons of money, and there's another guy who's dying, right? We're talking about death. We're not talking about living miserable lives, abject poverty. I'm not even talking about those things. So is there a problem? Uh, yes, of course, there's a problem. What is the problem? Where does it stem from? There's a two, pro two parts to this problem. One is the cost. And the other is access. The access to credit itself is a problem in most economies. Uh, the physical aspe aspect of the access, wherein the bank branch is not there. For example, in India, only 30% of India is banked uh, that ha have a physical access to a branch or a banker or somebody. Uh, then there's the problem of access in terms of even if I can reach to that place, uh, to the branch and all that, they don't allow me to take a credit, right? Uh, because of other reasons where their algorithms don't allow or their underwriting models don't allow them to give me a credit. There could be reasons like we have people, and it's not to do with some kind of apartheid or racism. There's chunks of people who don't get loans, even if they have access. They are credit worthy. People like SMEs who run a great business, uh, because banks have a, uh, the underwriting model is based on assets. What shop you own, where you own it, uh, how much inventory you have, and what about these today services-led businesses which are asset light? Most of us are run a business which is, we don't have just four computers and we're running companies. Uh, we really don't have anything to show off. We are on rented premises. Uh, our air conditions are rented. So there is a problem. So you can't get a bank credit in India. Then there are people like professionals, lawyers. They don't get law loans because in India, it's problem. there's a problem to recovery. And lawyers are very litigious. Uh, policemen don't get a loan in India. Same problem. They may, he may be a credit worthy guy. Then there are communities out there uh, because they stay in ghettos and those kind of things. Not ghettos, they, because of their poverty and all that, they stay in areas where they are dominated. And they don't get access to credit. So, even if they stay in an urban area right next to the biggest, largest bank headquarters, they may not get a loan. Even if they have a history of uh, repayments, they have income, they have ability, they're staying at the same place, still they will not get credit. Even if they get the credit, there's an issue about cost. I'll come on that later. Now coming on to this, why is this whole problem there? Uh, this problem is about actually monopoly on access control on information. Information to control everything. 
So till now we believed the banks can do all these things primarily because they have the power to aggregate monies. Uh, they have power to get your information about your financial data and it required large amounts of money to be spent in collecting data, generating data and disseminating data and crunching it. But today that is changing a lot of it because of you have other data sources. So basically they control the information and the funds because in most countries uh, only banks can take deposits. So the cost, the source of cheap funds is controlled by the banks or the financial institutions which are uh, authorized by the regulator. And this whole structure is very monopolistic. There are 157 banks in India, not more than that. Uh, only so and so person can open the bank or a financial institution and can take a deposit. Of course there have been issues of it, but it's not a free economy, it's not a free market. Uh, so there's a curtail, access to funds is a problem, the access to information is a problem. But that's changing. And all this goes into a black box which is called, uh, I don't know, that algorithm which they come out with and they define as uh, cost at what rate of interest you'll get a loan at, right? So we all go to a bank and he says 18.75, 4.5%. You really don't know, do not know what he did out there. Uh, you and your, between you and your friend, there's a difference of only 0.25 or something like that. Now, so this whole thing, nobody knows where, how it works, where it works, and uh, how the data is coming out and churning out. Uh, there's a lot of non-transparency or it's totally an opaque system of how the uh, system works out there. This is, the, I'm talking about the loan side from a borrower side. Uh, I don't think any of us as depositors are really happy with our banks, right? Uh, lady just now talked about how they're innovating with technology. All the technology which banks have been using has been going and adding to their profits. Have you ever got a bank has said that, look, I've saved money because I did this technological process and here's another 2% extra on your deposits. Right? Nobody has any banker come and told you that? They'll never come and told, tell you that. Because all the technology is going to create efficiencies which are basically adding to the profit margins rather than creating a value for the consumer level. Right? So that is one thing. Today banks actually charge you money if you visit them. Right? They don't want you to enter their premises. Which business wants to do that? I do not know. I've run so many businesses before this. Uh, we used to love when a customer used to walk into our premises. Uh, the whole organization used to be happy. But today they have devising ways, don't talk to me. Stay on the phone call. Let a voice talk to you. Okay. Oh, finally I'll talk to you. Okay. So the whole technology is to stay, make sure because the system is broken, the cost structures are so different that the consumer is not being given the benefit of that and they find it difficult and difficult today to service a customer. They are right in their way because the cost structures are such. But this is changing. Uh, this one slide, I've not added all the players out there. I didn't want to clutter the slide. I've just given some examples of this whole issue of cost and access. On one axis, you have the interest rates, and on the other axis is the access of credit in both terms of uh, how you get it and the reach of those uh, uh, businesses. So on the lower quadrant on the right side is the private sector banks, which interest rates are high, whatever the market is, uh, and the access is also similarly out there. Uh, out here, the low, they are on low interest rates, these are the public sector banks, which is the Canada Bank and the State Bank, where the, even to get a loan is a problem. Uh, you need to pay speed money, uh, those kind of things. And the interest rates are relatively lower than HDFC and the private banks. Uh, then on the right uh, quadrant are people like Capital Flow. These are new technology companies. They are really working on the access part of the business, wherein these are technology companies which are based on internet. You just come and, come and apply your loan, they are using new algorithms to come out with a solution for SMEs. And they make sure that the, your loan is processed really fast and they're opening up uh, capital for services companies and those kind of things. The 
on this quadrant uh, is Fairsent, which is the best of the world, uh, so to say, wherein we are using technology and uh, to bring in speed of access to the uh, uh, capital. Today, in eight months, we are operating on nearly 30 cities of across India, uh, which for a bank in India would have taken some five, six years, even if you start a new bank. Uh, we are using uh, capital. We are unlocking the capital because we have individual lenders. I'll not get into what peer-to-peer -peer lending is. I am presuming everybody understands that. The cost of capital is going down on our platform. Uh, typically, a borrower gets anything between two to four percentage points lower than what he would have got from a bank. Okay. And this is a testimony which the customers themselves are coming and telling us. Uh, before I go further, uh, this whole about sharing economy, uh, the sharing economy has been there. Uh, I would want to actually want to talk about something about India. Uh, we've had this peer-to-peer -peer models working in India for quite some time. Uh, my colleague, uh, my friend from India had talked about 40 years ago, 40 years ago, how they've crowdfunded a film. Uh, even in the financial and the debt market, the thing is that uh, we have various instruments. Uh, like chit funds, uh, we had uh, kitties and those kind of things, para banking, which were aggregating people at the uh, at small denominations and creating a debt product out of it. And they were offline and anecdotal. So there are some 20 people doing it together, some 40 people doing it together. Uh, but this whole technology thing is changing because is letting us bring in a lot of scale into the whole thing. Today, this because of we are aggregating lenders and borrowers, so we can actually break the whole paradigm of the information uh, monopoly which the banks have had till now, uh, because of which they are able to charge these rates to you, uh, at both at the borrower side and the lending side. So this democratization of data leads to, as they say, wackiness. It leads to a lot of stuff. Uh, but a lot of good stuff comes out of it. Uh, we believe that uh, this whole uh, Availability of the data can go into building algorithms which will help you in investing as an individual, just like a bank would do, and reap those profits, <laughs> rather than passing on to an intermediary. So how do we do it? Uh, these were the traditional models of underwriting. Uh, first is they work on your demographics. They work on your credit bureau data transactional data, existing obligations, and they come out with a score. And they used to say, OK, this is the rate of interest you should get. Uh, what we are doing is actually added three more layers to the whole thing. Uh, we are saying, can we look at big data analytics? Because there's a huge amount of data available. And thankfully, this is not the proprietary of any institution. Uh, this is freely available today and can be accessed by anybody. Uh, so we are churning that out uh, from from criminal history to online footprints, the kind of sites you visit to, uh, are you into gaming, online gaming, are you into gambling? Uh, there's a huge footprint which you are creating. Uh, the kind of restaurants you are checking into vis-a-vis -vis your income levels, uh, are you checking in? Uh, because when you check in into a five-star hotel and your income doesn't show that you can really afford it, it means there's some problem with you. Rather than saying, OK, what's your account? Uh, how does your bank statement look like? Right. Uh, the kind of devices you are using, uh, then location data, uh, for example, you come and say, I stay at this place, and you're not sleeping there, right? Maybe you're staying with somebody else, that's okay. But the point is, the eight hours of night sleep, if you're not putting up out there, so do you get actually validated that whether the, this can help in fraud management, right? Uh, similarly, whether you say, this is my workplace, and you're not checking, your phone data doesn't show that you are really spending eight hours or six hours or four hours there. Similarly, we are looking at psychometrics. Uh, a simple 20 question um, is used for uh, by a lot of companies to hire people. Uh, similarly, it can be used to predict whether what, what your delinquency might be, uh, how you predispose to certain things. Uh, you could ask very simple questions. If you had 200 rupees and you had to pay for this or that, would you rather pay your loan or you would go and buy something like that? So we ask these series of questions and understand whether you have a predisposition towards when the crunch comes, will you pay up or not? Right. 
Now, these kind of data are only possible if you are reinventing and reseeing the whole problem and the process uh, in terms of debt, uh, handling debt. Similarly, social media I talked about, that's a huge amount of information which is available. And yeah. so all this goes into, this is our proprietary thing wherein we uh, really work on scoring, validation, and risk mitigation. All these data are taken in. We have tie-ups with, we also use credit bureau data. But the point is that credit bureau data, so the whole idea is to use the existing infrastructure which has been created by banks, um, use it, disintermediate them, and disrupt them. Uh, so we use the credit bureau data. We have tie-up with Yodley. Uh, we are in talks with companies like Lendo, who do social scoring. And we, it goes into a scoring thing. Validation, verification, again, there's a whole ecosystem which has been created with unique ID system called Aadhaar in India, uh, which is a government thing. We're building apps over that and to authenticate a person on there. And it's a biometric authentication. So everything happens online. Across India, anybody can just log in, create an account. We authenticate that guy online. Similarly, on the risk mitigation, uh, we had a case uh, recently which we could mitigate was a lot of people in India are, are like IT professionals. Okay. So IT professionals who take a loan and they may be planning to go uh, abroad. And they have, so you really don't know he takes a loan and goes abroad. So, but reading their social data or a Facebook uh, kind of a thing that you can really understand whether they're going to uh, abroad or not because they start talking about those things. I'll just tell you how it works out. Finally, this is the kind of thing which happens. This is how we are indexing the whole thing because this data goes and goes and gives you out three outputs into indexing. Uh, you can really sort the people by the way you want them, uh, medium risk and all that. And you can see that the kind of these are the people who are getting funded uh, with the risk profiling and the kind of a business use they're use, going to use the loan for. This is where we actually give you the power of data I have not shown the full thing because this is confidential. But what we show is, besides the personal data, we show you his personal data. We show you his uh, uh, credit, credit history. And this is the outcome which comes out. This is a borrower who is actually rejected loans. Offers, that was the first one which he got at 25%. He pushes the debt interest rate to 19.75%. That he actually refused a 17.75% after accepting a 18.5. Okay? Uh, because he believed that he could. So, what he did was next he accepted a 60,000 from Abhishek Jani again because he gave him a bigger offer. Right? That is 60,000 rupees at 17.5%. He rejected a 40,000 at 17.7. Now, you see a new behavior happening. It's auction and reverse auction happening at the simultaneously. This is what real empowerment is from people committing suicides to saying that I don't want this loan. I want a lower rate of interest. Quick example, one guy, Prashant Naik, who was a borrower, his average rate was 21% when he was, went and asked for a bank. He got it at 18% on our platform. He did a saving of nearly 3,500 rupees, which is a big amount considering it's 100,000 rupees, nearly 3% saving. Similarly, sorry. Similarly, out here, uh, when this is a lender who paid, uh, his deposit rates were approximately 18%, uh, sorry, 8.75% uh, per from HDFC Bank. He put it out on 18%, and uh, over a period of nearly one year, he made extra 5,500. So the, both the lender and the borrower are making more money. Uh, you're breaking a system which is, uh, because cost of capital, when it comes down, it saves lives, in my opinion and it makes life much better. So it's a call, uh, I'll end up out here. Either we can fight the matrix, uh, and we can keep on fighting it. I don't think nothing will happen. We need to create a new order. Um, as uh, Kate said, uh, banks will go away, banking will remain. Uh, I think this is the new order which we need to create, and let's work towards it. Thank you. I saw the slide with uh, great presentation, by the way, and very exciting stuff that you're doing. The slide that listed um, the four areas where you get the score, uh, social media, da big data. 
there was four um, quadrants there. Uh, is there a certain percentage between those quadrants? Like, does uh, social media score, high, you know, a larger percentage of getting that score put together? Right, right. That final score, like, yep. it's kind of inter It's really interesting as far as you know, criminal history. You know, someone has a felony for burglary, maybe that's going to hurt their score, right? And then they have a high social media score. Um, how is that distributed, if you can even give that information out? So uh, this distribution is, of course, a little proprietary. I'll be upfront with you. Uh, what percentage, exact percentages go into it, it's a dynamic model. Uh, but the very fact that we're having a model which is working on these parameters, Naturally, the uh, traditional uh, data points carry a much higher weightage, uh, but they don't carry the weightage levels which a typical bank has it. Say nearly 80% or 90%, like 720 and less, nobody will come in. Um, but out here, we have a weightage for the traditional models around 40 to 60%. That's as low as that. So you have a greater chance of, uh, because if we believe that socially you are much better, when I explain the data on, supposing we have, we guys get from a credit card refinance. A lot of people come for a credit card refinance because the interest rates on credit card is 36% in India, right? And they want to get it refinanced at say 14% or 15%. Now what happens is that people in the age bracket of 80, so 27 to 35 get uh, what you call as salary, they max out their salaries because that's the stage in their life they are living in, wherein they have to spend money on car, buy a new car, a new house and all that. So at times the credit cards do get maxed out. Now we read those patterns and whether it's a consumption-based spending or need-based. Are they paying for a child's tuition, uh, school fees, or they're going and blowing it on the next iPhone, right? Uh, are the, where are they spending money on? Uh, where are they going for, from a social data point of view, whether they're going and, if that credit card doesn't show, are they going and spending money at expensive restaurants? Because they, most of them, when they go to expensive restaurants, they check in, right? So you get a whole lot of data and consumption and those kind of things, which right now are small percentages at the moment. But as we go along, as we get more and more credibility to that data point, we will keep on increasing that, and it's a dynamic process, so. My name is Pranesh. So, uh, and I'm from India too. Uh, I'm just trying to understand like how this relates to the same farmer which you have started your story with because the farmer doesn't have uh, anything online presence, any social media, any, any, any of this information, right? And 70% of our population is still in rural which is being tracked. Yep. Okay, so I gave you only two, two examples everywhere because I don't want to color, clutter the site. Look, we are not into the pharma part of it. Uh, we are in the urban, our target market is urban uh, consumer. But there are people who are doing that work in the pharma side of it, like Kiva, uh, Rangde.org, Milap. Milap is funded from in Singapore itself. Now they are actually going and funding the, under the, uh, the bottom of the pyramid, right? Where what they're doing is asking people, rather than donating money, they're asking them to lend money to them at 1% or 2%, right? On the next, what they do is collect that money and give to a farmer for buying his implement or to starting a some small, small shop at say 10 and 12 percent. Vis-a-vis, 36 percent or 20, 20, 25 to 36 percent charged by uh, microfinance institutions, right? Uh, the Grameen uh, uh, business is just like Grameen Bank and all that in which you run in India. So the cost of capital is coming down, right? Uh, so that's the good work which is happening and it's happening on the ground. Uh, that's the reality. So we are helping people who are not able to access uh, credit. Uh, we have people like Muslims coming, I'm sorry, don't do it, uh, take me wrong. Uh, but in India, Muslims get a problem, have a problem in uh, getting a debt because they live in communities where the recovery is an issue. So we have a model wherein uh, one Muslim can give a loan to another Muslim. Similarly, policemen have a problem. Police, one policeman can give a loan to a policeman, and the recoveries between the two is quite simple. So that's the how uh, the thing is happening out here. Okay, let's move to that question. Uh, sorry, I have another uh, question on your the data slide again. Which uh, one? I was just the the quadrants one. I was just curious um, how easy was it to access? How much of that data is floating around versus that you have to pay versus you have to actually go and ask them to fill out all this information. Oh, the one before. Um, 
Yeah, that one. Mm. Yeah, so how, how, I guess how, how easy is it to pull together all that data and, and how much of it is just freely accessible to anybody to use or did you have to like put a lot nothing of work is, into it? Nothing is easy. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me be very clear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a lot of hard work which goes out here. Uh, it's not that people are just dying to give us data and all that. Uh, yes, there's a problem about first thinking it up. Second is adoption. Like we just implemented Yodler integration, uh, we're implementing the Facebook data, uh, LinkedIn data integrations, and we take steps very slowly. Uh, we are not a company on steroids, I'll be upfront with you, uh, because the adoption and its financial data, it takes time. So what we started doing was first actually reading your fa Facebook and LinkedIn profiles before we implemented going and implementing it. Whether this data is really worth it or not. Because it's very sexy nowadays to just ask everybody to just log in from this Facebook and LinkedIn, right? And you don't know what to do with it, whether it's worth it also or not. So we do keep on testing that. We first did a lot of testing that whether this data which we are coming out with is making sense or not. Uh, adoption will remain an issue because we are talking about a financial product. Um, but if people can share their nude pictures on Facebook, they'll be able to do this. <laughs> we personally believe that. <laughs> so that's the thing. Great. Rajat, thank you very much for thank coming. You. Great insights. Thank you. And best wishes to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.